and stuff. And a lot of churches will do like a sort of Passover during Easter time. I, I really believe it shouldn't be called Easter. But um, what happens here is um, the last plague, which is going to absolutely crush the Egyptians, is the plague of the firstborn. That's um, that's the death of of usually the most important um, child to a lot of these um, to a lot of these people and what happens is in order to have the evil spirit that is going to pass judgment on these Egyptians in order to have them uh, that spirit pass over the Israelites God asked Moses to tell everyone to get an unblemished lamb a, a lamb that has no no faults, no broken bones, huh? and issues, no sickness, to kill it and to put the blood of that lamb on their doors. And yeah. Jesus is called the lamb, the lamb of, of God. And so it's really symbolic of the fact that Jesus' blood was shed in order for us to not have to die the consequences um, of our sin. Because the wages of sin is death. And so in the Old Testament, that's why people often had to give sacrifices um, to atone for their sins. We no longer have to do that. Why? Because Jesus actually did, died the ultimate death. He was the, the lamb who did nothing wrong, the, the lamb without blemish, without fault. And he died a death that he didn't deserve, that we deserved, so that we might be saved from our sins and that's why a lot of christians practice the the passover it's it represents jesus's blood um covering us so that we are saved from the retribution that we we truly deserve is there a um is there a specific month and day when this happens like for us i guess as christians yeah so basically when easter is supposed to happen Easter's kind of, in my opinion, a, a blasphemous thing to call it. Um, Easter is actually, it's named after uh, the Roman god of um, fertility, I believe, which was a, a rabbit that laid eggs. And so it's actually kind of a bastardization of what, what the day really should be. And it's surprising to me that Christians will call it that. But it's it's supposed to be those days when Jesus got crucified and then rose again. Um, those those three days are supposed to be you know, holy between there, um, from the crucifixion to when he uh, rises again, resurrection Sunday. And the Passover would uh, be the the Friday. What was it? The, yeah, Alec, am I getting that correct? Yeah. Um. So the Last Supper. Uh, they were actually celebrating Passover, right? So most Christians now, Easter, they're celebrating, you know, the death and the resurrection of Christ, right? So Easter in itself is the celebration of uh, Christ resurrecting, right? Um, and then the Passover isn't quite right on Easter. Uh, the Hebrews, I might get these two mixed up, so like, forgive me, right? But Easter is either on the solar or the lunar calendar, and then the Hebrews go on the opposite one, right? So Passover is slightly different. Um, the days are slightly different, and then Passover actually lasts seven days, right? Um, and Passover in itself is celebrating um, when God uh, brought the Egyptians out of Egypt, right? And then Easter, the concept of those three days of Easter, is actually celebrating the resurrection. Yeah, but Easter was named after that pagan god, so I don't think it should be called Easter necessarily. And yeah, Passover, that's, that's, that's for sure. Come again. Come again. I said, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, yeah. the The name, the name of it, Easter, I do believe is like a pagan, a pagan thing, right? Um, but and it's super interesting days. how the how the Last Supper and the, the whole death of Christ align with the Passover. That's just one of the most interesting things here. What I did, 
Um, in regards to this, though, was something that I couldn't keep skipping over without questioning as far as, you know, he's talking about striking down the firstborn and killing the firstborn, especially I think we see in 13, um, the firstborn male, right, of every, like, family and offspring. Is he talking about the Israelites and the Egyptians and the animals, like everybody, or, 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 or who are they sp directly speaking to here? Because I was kind of confused if he was killing the Israelites as well. Well, not the Israelites, because the Israelites, my bad if I didn't explain this properly, but the Israelites put the blood of unblemished lambs on their doors, and that was supposed to be the marker that told the the evil spirit to not kill their firstborns. So God had a, a, a spirit of death go through Egypt and kill all the firstborns of the families that did not have that blood on the doorposts. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah. Week, I think you're talking about 13, right? The consecration, the, the uh -huh. consecration, right? Of the firstborn. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so the, the firstborn of the Hebrews, right? You're supposed to uh, commit to the Lord, right? So your firstborn is committed to the Lord. You're not killing him, but the first fruits of your crop, of your, of your, um, livestock, they, he is talking about killing the first fruits of the livestock as sacrifice for right. Um, regardless if it's re regardless if it's Egyptian livestock or Israelites livestock or Israel's. Yeah. So this is this Sorry. is a new thing that now that the Egyptians are in the in the desert, right, and they're going to the new land. These are new um, traditions that God is giving them, right. So now your firstborn is going to be committed to the Lord, right, and then your the the first fruits of your livestock. Um, you'll give as sacrifice to the Lord for constant thank thankfulness for um, what the Lord did, bringing, bringing them out of slavery from Egypt, mm. right? And then you have the, the death of the firstborn, which was the punishment in Egypt prior to this happening, which is what Bryn is talking about, where the anybody with the blood of the lamb on their door uh, was uh, pardoned from, from that punishment. Man. That's con that's contextual. <laughs> there was a couple verses in uh 13 that stood out to me. Um, one was being 12 right here. Uh well, this is just a really exact well, we really just touched base on it. It's just saying you are to give over the Lord the first offspring of every womb, all the for firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with the lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn born among your sons. In days to come, when your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, with the mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That's powerful. Uh, when Pharaoh stubbornly refuses to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. So that's exactly what we just touched base on. Um, 19 says, Moses took the bones. Oh, right here, this was interesting too, because Joseph was the king before Pharaoh came, correct? And um, right here is just seeing, seeing how, because Joseph was actually um, leading the Israelites. He was not a Pharaoh. He was actually a just king, right? Correct? Yep, and um, just to see here how Joseph was still with him, uh, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones with you from this place. So I just wanted to make sure I read that verse. Lee, yep. um, have you seen, um, this is movie, uh, I think it's called The Prince of Egypt. I don't know if anybody's seen it. It's like an animated um, it's like an animated little movie, but I haven't. Uh, I don't remember it very well. Yeah, I saw that when I was young. <laughs> yeah, I saw it when I was a kid, but um, that's another one. It's all not. Right, it's right, not right, as right. serious. It's not nearly as serious as the Passion of the Christ. Okay. But you know what I mean. It's the story. It breaks it down to you, and you can you know you can just having that visual can help you know a lot of times. So, the Prince of Egypt. Is the title of that movie, and it's, it's pretty solid. I'm not gonna lie. Okay, got it. I I want to say I might have. I have to look though. Did um, you ask if Moses was a just king? 
No, I was saying Joseph. Oh, wait. Did you say Moses or Joseph? Moses. No, Joseph. I was saying, I was just trying to describe Joseph here as um, basically uh, the total opposite of who Pharaoh is and just seeing how Joseph, um, how they still carry his, his bones. As Yeah. I, I mean, Joseph wasn't the, the king. He uh -huh. was technically under the king. He was an Israelite. And Pharaoh oh. put him at the, the highest position that he could possibly be without being the Pharaoh. So he was, um, and the Pharaoh prior, obviously because of the whole story, the Pharaoh prior loved Joseph. So Joseph wasn't the Pharaoh. Joseph was an Israelite that was beloved by, by that Pharaoh. And then a new Pharaoh came in and after Joseph's death and stuff, and he didn't like the Israelites. Okay, so Joseph wasn't the ruler of Egypt. He was just a high Not rank. Not the ultimate ruler, yeah. Affirmative. Not the ultimate ruler. A ruler in a way, but not the ultimate ruler. Okay. I thought, well, what? Did, let me make. Why did they. And then a new king. He was king, though, right? No. No, he wasn't. Um. Yeah, because then a new king came to who Joseph meant nothing. So a new king came. Okay, that makes sense. I'm glad you brought that up because I was I was thinking Joseph was the initial king and then Pharaoh came and took over. But Joseph wasn't the king. He just was, like you said, just like a, a super high official who had the king's trust, I guess. Affirmative. We should actually go through Genesis eventually with this group. Yeah. That'll help a lot of these things make a lot more sense because right. a lot of these are kind of calling back to that book. Yeah, we're starting from definitely it's, now that I'm here. I was like when I first started this at the beginning of this year, I read like maybe two books and I was just like, yeah, let me just take a book. But now I'm realizing the importance of starting from the beginning of a book. <laughs> oh, definitely. So next book is definitely gonna be Genesis, and then we can move forward from there. But if I'm not mistaken, if somebody uh, can correct me, did Pharaoh and um Joseph not grow like basically grow up together? No, they didn't grow they up didn't? together. So Not Joseph, Joseph was, grew up. Um, he was his father was Jesse. He had a whole bunch of brothers. He had right. a bunch of crazy dreams that God gave him. And then, I think the way it's kind of framed is he used the dreams to boast, and he said to his brothers that his brothers were going to bow down to him. Oh, I'm a, I'm on the wrong story. Um, I'm on the oh, wrong story. Not, I'm sorry, Moses. You, you mean Moses growing up with them? Yes, I'm sorry, Moses. Moses, yeah. like they basically him and Pharaoh grew up together, basically, right after Moses was the. the okay, that's what I was trying to like. Well, a little, a little well, background, why Malik. We, well, why did we read this from where Moses was born while in the river, and Pharaoh was the ruler? At he was still ruler. What do you? Pharaoh's a title of the leader. You know what I'm. So there are different pharaohs. It's okay. like same king. Yeah. It's more than right. one pharaoh here. Yeah. It's okay. just the king oh, or the president at the time, you know what I mean? Okay. But the specific Pharaoh that is in power now, him and Moses came up together. For real? I yeah. think you're quite correct. But, you know, it seems like he doesn't know about Moses because um, Moses, because remember how it said that all the people that wanted him dead uh, were themselves dead. And so that would indicate he probably doesn't fully know everything about Moses. So it might actually be the one after that. It might be a younger guy. That's a valid point. That's a valid point. I don't know. I, you know, I'm just speculating because I would assume that if that Pharaoh was like, oh, you're the guy that murdered that Egyptian, then he right. would just kill Moses. Yeah. Right. We saw we see Moses be born here in Exodus, right? And just, I don't recall ever getting context on these the pharaoh that's in place now and moses growing up together and things of that nature I, it didn't uh, specify it's just interesting to think about um yeah it's, yeah it's, it's a possibility i mean the the movie there's a movie called exodus which is a terrible movie um and very kind of blasphemous it represents god as a child but um but yeah they they had some ideas of like that kind of thing like it they tried to expand on Moses's Egyptian family and such, um, which made it interesting. But, you know, I think those the reason why oh, that's coming out that is because it's not necessarily relevant. Oh, wait, 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 wait. 
But no, it can't have been because remember, Pharaoh's daughter is the one who actually picked up Moses from the river. Mm -hmm. This Pharaoh. So I believe the genealogy is so there was a Pharaoh when Moses was, was found in the river. <laughs> Moses' daughter, um, Pharaoh's daughter found Moses. Okay. Oh. And then when Moses, oh. so Moses grew up part of that royal family, right? Right. And then Moses' Egyptian mom her brother came into power, right? And then uh, Moses is coming back into Egypt now after the 40 years in exile. Mm -hmm. So he, so yes, Moses and the new Pharaoh that hardened his heart, he, um, him and Moses were kind of like half brothers. In a, in a right. Sense. Or uncle, I'm sorry, uncle and nephew. Right? Oh, yeah. Not, okay, okay. I thought, I thought it was where do we, where do we, uh, why, that why, why doesn't he want Moses to be killed? You know, where's his, his mom, um, Moses' mom, stuck up for him. Interesting. So how where, where do you find, is that like some historical documentation? Because I actually haven't found that in the Bible like, necessarily. Like, like, have we not Have we not gotten that far yet? Because we still, we haven't scratched. Now, that's prior knowledge to this story. That's before this story? No, 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 not prior knowledge. I'm saying like leading up to this point, like. For real? You know, in the story, that's already like known at this point. Yeah. Like you don't find that out. Where, do find, where do you find it in the Bible? I'm, I'm That's super what I'm curious. Saying, about that. I haven't read that, and I and I want to say I've been I've been reading this. this I want to. So, I mean, I I okay, yeah. Me I'm hearing that I missed this is just very like, just like hardening my my head here. <laughs> um. Okay. This is yes. The birth of Moses is here in two. All right. So. When she saw that he was a yeah okay so now Alec I know you were pointing it somewhere where you did you find it already or should we read this uh, so if you go to so in eleven he uh he grows old right and then um he uh kill he killed Pharaoh her dismay sought to kill so the first Pharaoh sought uh seeks to kill Moses in second fifth. 15 um and then then Moses flees uh -huh. and then the king and then that king dies okay so we and do then we go into three that where Moses the burnt has the burnt mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Egyptian. Where does he? Where does uh, the brother take over the throne? Yeah, that's what I want to see. Yeah, I'm super curious about that. Not open, came well, here. it kind of goes without saying, right? Because if Moses, if the king dies, his son would take would take over, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that is that is kind of the the office. And yeah. then that, and then but do we see the that one? It weirds me out that he's not trying to kill Moses, because surely his father would be like that Israelite that that we raised. He's now murdered one of our own, and then would have got everyone riled up against him. And it's not like the the Pharaoh that hardened his heart against God was, you know, favorably disposed towards Moses. So I think if he had a reason to kill him, I don't see why he wouldn't. Gershom. So is Jer is. Is Gershom, that's Gershom is Moses' son? Gershom, um, yeah. Okay, I'll kind of skip that. That might come up later. Does he, does, does Gershom show up later in the story or not really? I mean, a I little bit. Story, but like, uh, which, which chapter are you reading? Which chapter are you reading? Oh, Exodus 2, yeah. He, he does kind of show up. He's not like a super important character, but yeah, he does show up a little bit later when okay. when most rejoins his, his family. 23 right there. That's where we see. Okay, see, that's why you got to kind of just keep reading the Bible and reading it and reading it because I literally missed all of this. Okay, so during that long period, the king of Egypt died. Okay, that makes sense. So the new pharaoh that we're reading currently is not the original pharaoh Moses born. It's a great point. There, cry for help because the slavery went to God. God heard her growing. Remember, 
covenant. So God will. And then chapter him. four, Moses rolls into Egypt and he shows the miracle. He like turns his rod into a snake, right? He um, he does those miracles in front of Pharaoh and he says, let my people go, right? So that kind of sets a precedent now where he's doing these miraculous things and he's being protected by God at this point. You know what I find so interesting about the um, about the story of of uh, the lost plague is also it represents that's the thing that was really supposed to break that nation, supposed to break Pharaoh especially, because that's the most important thing to him is his firstborn son, and God, you know, sacrifices his word his his son, his only begotten son. So I think there's more symbolism there. It's like, look, this is the most important thing that absolutely breaks people if they lose this. And I sacrificed it for you. That's how much I love you guys. Uh, you know, that's how much I love the people I created. That's a good point. The first, yeah, the firstborn son is very, um, I get, I, I guess you could say, I don't know what other word to use here, but symbolic. <laughs> in a sense because you see it here in this story as well that's yeah. a good point now moving forward there um there was some the in 14 there was a couple quotes here too that stood out and i will harden pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them oh this is when um this is when they leave this is when they leave and then the pharaoh starts chasing them in 14 which is very funny um alec did you have something i had something Right yeah. Quick. yeah so i went back to i read I like i've been reading like from the beginning of exodus and it doesn't co like specifically i guess say that um i guess the order of the pharaohs and how they kind of took place but i do see that pharaoh's daughter at the time moses became her son so I know that by that being that then the next pharaoh whoever was in line definitely knew who that Moses was because and I like so I don't really know like their relationship, but I definitely know that Moses grew up with whoever that was. That's just from the line of command. To be around them yeah. just because of being in the royal family and being around them. Not sure about their relationship, like we were talking about, um trying to figure out. Um but it's it would I think better. it would be his uncle then because if if Moses was technically Pharaoh's daughters, so at that time basically Moses is Pharaoh's grandson. Yeah. Now, so you know, I guess that technically that would be his uncle next in power, because it would be Pharaoh's next son. So I don't know. That's what I. I'm, that's glad, what I'm I put together. I'm with you there. I'm with you there. Even though it's rare, I'm with you, GB. But I'm, but I'm <laughs> sorry, but I'm <laughs> with you there, brother. That made the story better. Um, but here, yeah, here in fourteen was really cool to see how. Um, Pharaoh was like being so kind of cool and nonchalant, but then he kind of realized how important the Israelites really were to his power because he needed them for his, for, to keep his power because he needed their service. Um, but here again, we also see God hardening, hardening Pharaoh's heart, which is just at this point is very, it's just, okay, here we go again. But here it says for and i will harden pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them but i will gain glory for myself through pharaoh and all his army and the egyptians will know that i am lord so the israelites did this when the king of egypt was told that the people had fled pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said what have we done we have let the israelites go and have lost their service so they kind of realized how important the israelites were even though they diminished their value just uh based off the i guess you could say the worldly order that they they placed them in here um so basically they went off they started chasing them um it probably is contextually not that important to skip but um 12 stood out to me so didn't we say to you in egypt leave us alone let us serve the egyptians oh then the israelites started complaining to um they started complaining about leaving slavery, which was crazy. But um, that that's something that I wanted to talk about, too, in this little period between 14 and 17 is how we saw how Pharaoh and the Egyptians wouldn't learn their lesson in regards to who God was here. 
But then we also see the same the same sequence from the Israelites um, coming up here, which was kind of annoying. But at the same time, when you I started to relate a little bit, sadly, but I wanted to dive into that, too. I know I got some highlights on that, but 12 said, didn't didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So now they're in the desert. Um, basically, Moses is leading them out of Egypt. And now they're complaining because they felt like it would have just been a better life in slavery. That right there, I don't want to miss out on because that kind of ties into what I was talking about before we even got into this study. When we kind of correlated to us as men, a Christian men, right? They got to go through this desert, which is worst case scenario. We don't got food. We don't got no water. I'm just trusting you as vessels of God to, to think that and have faith in there may be something better on the other side of this, right? But I got to go through hell, which literally they are going to walk through the land of sin, which is cool too as well. But just knowing that towards the end of this story, um, well, I wish I knew, but I'm going to just say I assume they obviously get freed and um, they're free from slavery, but but that was just kind of correlating to what I was saying earlier is like, OK, it could be comfortable. Right. The devil could live in comfort. Right. Their situation in slavery, they're complaining about maybe I should have gone back um, because it was comfortable. I didn't have to worry about anything. I could, you know, I would just do my job and that's it. But God had more for them. And Moses and Aaron were um, were called to ultimately free them from that. And now they're complaining about ultimately getting free. But we're also reading this story on Exodus 14, knowing that there's 15, 16, and 17, which is so cool because this is where they're at, right? Even though we're here. So like, it's kind of keeping that perspective when we're reading 14 is that they're here in the desert. They don't know what's on the other side of the desert. You know what I'm trying to say? I just went yeah. on. I, went I think on. that they doing the same thing as what Moses did. Uh -huh. Because it's crazy. They've seen all these amazing things that God did. God proved that he was the real God. Uh -huh. And now they actually are not having enough faith thinking that God will not provide for them. It's crazy. Like when Moses was like, oh, I'm not good at speaking after seeing God perform these signs. I'm not good at speaking. So can you have someone else do the speaking for me? How can I do this? It's the same thing. <laughs> and on top of that, it's kind of like, Makes me think of like a child that's stuck in his parents' basement and he gets fed every day. They pay for all this stuff and it's super nice and comfortable. And then when they know what's best for him, give him some freedom, kick him out, um, make him go get a job. You know, his life might be more fulfilling, but now he's a little bit afraid. And so he might actually point at them and be like, why did you do this to me? I had a fine life. But, yeah, you know, you're not supposed to be stuck in a basement. The only people that do nothing are dead people. And, you know, it's just like a useless eater. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean that, but then that concept as well for somebody that's listening to this or reading this story who may be in that position where it's like, I'm super comfortable where I'm at. Um, but something's, something's pulling me to more, but I have no clue at all. Um, what's on the other side of that. I know it's scary. I, and that that even at the micro level, when we were talking about our day to day little like you were kind of saying, you know, if I do that small hard task, I know that when that next bigger hard task shows up, I know I can take it on. Same kind yeah. of concept here, you know, when you read it from even though it's a macro event, even when you read it from a micro little thing, you know, oh, discomfort. But I know if I go through this hard, I know once we finish this story, if not. I'm going to be mad, but I know after reading Job's story, I know the end of the story going to be something good. So, um, but that's just, that's just something to, to chew on, to chew on going into the week as well. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Most people would rather live without responsibility than live with hope. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't want to speak on that. Like it's easy, you know, um, because even myself, um, I struggle with that too, you know, like I, that's definitely not easy. So I definitely wanted to put that out there that it's not easy, but that hard is really where God is, is at. Cause we see it in here. God, God's not in the easy. God's not in the, um, Oh, if I just sit back and pray and read my Bible, 
one day, it's been 10 years, right? But one day he's going to come and he's going to take me to ultimately where he needs me to go. No, he's he needs us to act as well. You know, faith without action is dead. So I feel like that's a good point that we're kind of beating on um, today, which is one of one of my favorite sayings is uh -huh. that I've heard is nothing grows in the comfort zone. Right. <laughs> like that's is true with true with their situation, true with you know, our everyday situation, whether it's work, you know, sports, uh, relationship with God, like you, you, the minute you start being comfortable, too comfortable and start thinking, oh, man, if I if I just get up and I I say my prayer, read my devotional, whatever it is, that that's good things are going to happen, you know, and versus feeling uncomfortable, you know, doing challenging ourselves every week to, you know, do a little bit more, you know, be a little bit walk in the path of of Jesus a little bit more this week you know yeah. it's it make you feel a little uncomfortable right but you gotta and again nothing they could have stayed in Egypt and you know got got fed and 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 everything and you know know where they're getting the water know we're getting their getting their food but you know you gotta you gotta trust in the Lord you gotta go through some go through the trials and tribulations in in order to you know see what what really is on the other side so that's that was my little two cents. Oh, that's that's, that's, spot that's spot on because it all correlates too. And that's why I feel like the biggest piece of it all, like I used to, when I first started off, I had my, I had my mental walk, you know, where now it's really like, okay, mental and spiritual have become really one. Uh, my mental walk used to be my ego, where it's like, uh, I got to be the, I got to be the, I got to be the David Goggins or like the, the, the super disciplined dudes. And I got to do this mental, like hard thing where now the spiritual and the mental have kind of combined. Um, but now I'm realizing how they all correlate as you were talking about Joey there. So that's huge. Cause I know you could see those same principles show up when you're on the mats that you do when you show up, when, uh, you know, you're taking some time to practice as far as, um, reading the word every, when you do. So that's huge. Okay, we're getting rolling. I like that. We're getting rolling. Um, 14, I like four, verse 14 in Exodus 14 because it said the Lord will fight for you. Um, you need only to be still. Um, I feel like sometimes I hear him best when I'm not moving to get direction, um, but definitely don't want to be still too long as we spoke about. But I feel like if I'm constantly distracted in the world or on my day to day, I don't necessarily have that that connection as 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 well as I should. Uh, twenty one and fourteen. Hey, um, so my so I like the new king the new King James translation on uh -huh. this fourteen. Oh, um, it says the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. You know, so kind of like what you were saying, but like correlating that verse with peace, right? So what what why am I holding my peace? Is because I I trust that the Lord is fighting for me, right? I was um, um editor. Yeah, the Lord yeah, shall fight for you. Shout out to New King James. Just saying, guys. You know, just saying. I like it. I like it. I like it. Let me uh did new the this one right here for some reason is just like super like dumbed down a little bit. I don't want to use that word, but I don't know. I read King James and there was like some hard words. I need to read it a little bit more though. King James is a little tough. I'll say that. Yeah, so, New King James uh, is easier. All right, 21, then Moses stretched out. Oh, this was when he split the sea. So then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with the wall of water on their right and on their left. 25 here um, is where now the, the um, Egyptians... Army has started chasing them, trying to go down that same path. And God said, hold on, hold on, brother. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. All right. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And at daybreak, the sea went back into its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it and the Lord swept them into sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. So e Egyptians dead. 
Egyptians lay in dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and Moses and his servants. So there that is right there. The Egyptians, right before they died, realized who the Lord was. Um, and then the Israelites at the end of that knew who the Lord was as well. So I like 14. That was that was good. In 15, they were just really uh, praising God now, you know, um, as far as who God is and giving him all the praise and really singing songs here, which was cool. But 15 had some heat in here as far as, you know, God just kind of popping his chain a little bit. I liked it. Um, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. I love that one. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. Yeah, I like that. Uh, 25. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it. Wait, I think we're missing a big piece here. Um, I did they start complaining here already about not having water? I want to say so. Um, I want to say that they they started complaining for water. It's either in this one or the next one, but twenty four, verse twenty four, and the people complained against Moses, saying, "What shall we drink?" So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. Yeah, and when he cast it into the water, the waters remained sweet. Boom, boom, boom. Then the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord, your God, and do what's right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases that I brought onto the Egyptians. For I am Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. That's a huge verse. Uh, 16. Yeah, can we talk through that a little bit? There's a lot of symbolism there. Okay. There's a okay. lot. There's a lot. There's Give it to me. There. Give it to me. Um, okay, so okay. one, there was 12 wells of water, which we know uh, by reading, like if we read in the future, there's going to be 12 tribes of Israel, right? So, and then we know Jesus is the living water, right? So to me, I, I just highlighted that. I thought that was awesome symbolism there. Uh, just to kind of pick up on 12 wells, 12 tribes of Israel, and then the wells of water, which Jesus is the living water, right? 27. And then, um, yeah, 27. And then I feel like uh, 26 is a little prophetic a little bit um, where he's saying, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statues, I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians. So it's all, it's, you know, it's a little bit of a, to me, I'm reading that and then going to kind of jump. There's in Revelation 16, there's bowl judgments before the second coming of, of Jesus, right? Where all the believers have now either been killed or raptured. And there's a lot of similar judgments from the plagues of Egypt that the non-believers that refuse to repent are going to are going to have to go through. Right. So some to me, I, I was reading this and it kind of stuck out and it's a little little bit prophetic, you know, something that we can we can see as a warning. Right. That, yeah. you know, he said he will bring some of these punishments back if we don't keep his commandments and do and keep all his statues. Right. Yeah. A, a little bit of a warning. And then I think he flexes a little bit after giving the warning. He brings them to the 12 wells of water, right? Um, kind of prophetic in the future of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Threw him the bag. <laughs> but yeah, that 20, that 25 right there, um, you know, I mean, 26, that's a huge one. I, I was just going to read through it just because I was like, I may be getting long winded, but they're talking about it just blatantly right there as far as listening to the spirit, you know? Um, and that'll keep you that should keep you away from the from the worldly fleshly diseases that come with, you know, that ripened fruit by choosing the flesh. So I like that one. Um, Mana and Quail. 
All right. So, yeah, this is where I was talking about earlier. They literally got sent to the desert of sin, <laughs> but they just keep getting sent through these little, um, I would call it sharpening because he's definitely sharpening their faith here because they continue to complain. But that's another story. Uh, but, yeah, so the whole Israelite community here in 16, they went through the desert of sin. Um, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Here we go again. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Because <laughs> they don't see past, they don't, they don't see past the present, which is a clear indication of the lack of faith, even though God has already showed them. You know what I'm trying to say? It's kind of funny because I'm talking about it like, wow, like how could you do that? But I find myself constantly kind of doing that too at times, you know, whereas like he's already, he's already taken me through things in my life that when another situation comes up, I'll still catch myself um, worrying, getting anxious, getting fearful, um, stressing, or, or I guess you can call it anxiety about what's next to come because I, because they don't see it and I don't see it either in my own walk. Um, but it's just kind of funny to see the human, the humanistic in it. But at the same time, it is kind of, it's not, uh, it shouldn't be acceptable just because he's already proved himself, but he's definitely going to prove himself again. If only, yep. So 12, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites tell them at twilight, you will eat meat. And in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. My question is how he's, he always, he's always spoiling them though. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, it's almost like a, a baby tantrum and then the baby just gets his way. I mean, at the same time, he is sending them through some tough um, situations here. Don't get me wrong. So uh, that, that can, I guess you, I guess you can say justify, but at the same time, that's a, this is a clear sign of God's favor. You know what I'm trying to say? Um, God's favor is not is not transactional, you know, like is a is a gift. It's a gift. I don't know, Alec, if you were hearing something. Yeah, for sure. And I, I just think um, the end of four kind of speaks uh -huh. to that a little bit. He says, I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Right. And then we and then he oh, starts to give them some blessings. I like that. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. So, I mean, kind of just to like bring that into our daily lives, right? Oh. Like, yeah, God is sovereign, but also what does he say in verse 26, right? If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all the statutes, you know? So then, so he can give us something good, but we can't be, we can't forget to stay humble and to understand that is a sovereign gift and it's also a test, right? Like if he yeah. get made the captain of the team, you know, it's a gift. You're the captain of the team now, but also it comes with some responsibility, right? Correct. 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 And that responsibility you have to take up with him for direction. And I want to say that's something I struggle with a lot, but I really struggled with last week. Um, and I don't really like to bring my work life into the studies, um, but I literally was getting the right direction from God um, in regards to a lot of my sales, uh, my sales appointments. Um, but as soon as I didn't get a sale, right, I, I completely went to the world for the answers and I went straight to um, the world for the answers. You know, I went straight to my ego, to my, my, my nose things when I literally should have just kept, um, kept progressing with, um, taking it to him and really dissecting it with him as far as, oh, maybe we should go here in this direction um, next time. Um, and then it took me like two days to realize what I was doing. I was on YouTube and then I was um, hitting up the mentors and it was like, bro, you know who you need to go to this about first. Like, let's go there first. And I went there and got the answer. And then right after that, I was good to go. You know what I'm saying? Um, but that was a test of the week. And to just to see if I'm gonna follow his instructions. But I keep telling y'all, I'm so hard headed, bro. Like I'm telling y'all now, the last thing that I'm doing is listening until it's like, listen, bro. <laughs> but I'm working on it. We're working on it. It's okay. But I just wanted to be honest there. Um, 
12 says, I have heard the grumbling and the Israelites tell them at twilight. Okay, we already saw that. So yeah, he gave them the food, which is, it's just, I feel like that's a cool sign of God's favor, you know? Um, I don't think we should take advantage of that, but we saw that in Job too, you know, he give them a little, he give them a little argument, but God's, God's sovereign. So it's always going to come for our greater good. Um, then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you um, refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. Isn't that like an important kind of thing right there? Do we? Yeah. Talk about that a little bit, Alec. Yeah, I mean, dude, when I read how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws, I feel like <laughs> just I highlighted how long. Like, to me, that's so sobering, right? You know, um, and that's something that I remember kind of like earlier, you know, in my walk, I kind of like reading this, it stuck out because it was sobering. It was like, how long are we going to do this dance? Like, wh when are you just going to relinquish all all trust? And it's it's a hard, it's hard, but it's it's good to read this again and just kind of have that sobering how long like how simply just that how long are we going to do this you how know long? um yeah and uh i think it just shows the importance of the sabbath day you know um i think that's something that many christians just kind of put put to the side and say you know uh it's important but you know i still gotta get my stuff done you know to me i uh one of my teachers when he talks about the sabbath he goes god made the entire earth in six days and you're going to say that you can't get all your work done in six days. You know, he's, he's telling you to take the Sabbath day. It was made for you. It's important, right? And I just think some of that is just just like tithing, you know, like giving money to the, giving money to the church. The Sabbath day is an act of worship. You know, it's like I'm not doing anything on my Sabbath day to yeah. forward my life. You know, now that doesn't mean you can't do things for pleasure. You can't hang out with friends and things like that. But, you know, like doing the car, like, you know, I even, you know, I even like to like, if I go to the grocery store, I'll get stuff for the food for that day. I won't go grocery shopping on my Sabbath day or like, you know, like cleaning my car. Right. Like I won't clean my car on my Sabbath day because though, you know, it's it's I'm just trying to hold myself accountable to giving that time to worship, you know, and doing and just doing things, hanging out with friends, doing things with pleasure, relaxing, sleeping, not getting caught up on emails and things like that. Um, I just think that's just something so important that we just skip over. And, you know, the Lord, God is putting this in an act right away. And it's part of the testing, right, that, mm -hmm. that he's putting through. So I just, think, I just think that kind of connects to, like, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? You know, and the Sabbath is included in that, you know? I think it's just part of like having reverence for the Lord, right? Not just fear of the Lord, but reverence of the Lord by taking that Sabbath day, you know. Um, yeah. Taking that At Sabbath the same day. time, though, uh, there's right. definitely important things that could be considered work that, you know, we can and maybe should do on the Sabbath. Things like, you know, when the disciples were picking grains because they were hungry or, um, you know, Jesus talking about how if your donkey falls in a well, you got to you're obviously going to go and take care of that or if you're you know you blow a tire you know not to be legalistic about it to be able to go out and you know heal people on the sabbath like jesus did those things are, are things you can and should do but yeah as as a general rule i mean the sabbath was made for people not people for the sabbath so we're supposed to have a day of rest i mean there's um i'm sure there's plenty of evidence that if you take um, four days of rest in a month it improves your efficiency in your work a whole lot more because you just you you need a break for a second and you got to keep in mind god taking that break on the seventh day god doesn't need a break he's got infinite power but he just decided to take a break because not everything in life is about work and productivity some of it you know there's other parts to life that we can add to mm. And now is the Sabbath day Sunday or is it um, a specific day? It's originally Saturday, but I don't think it necessarily matters. I think that's one of the things you don't necessarily need to be legalistic about. Okay. It's just supposed to be one day out of the seven days that you're actually here. Yeah. 
Okay. So, I mean, obviously, like, let's say you're a government official. God wouldn't ex expect them, like, to have absolutely no security guards or something like that working on Sunday. Because then, what, like, some foreign country just attacks us on Sunday and we can't do anything about it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe they, Saturday is Monday because their shift goes on to that, on to that Sunday. So maybe that's the Sabbath. Makes sense. I like it. I like it. 34 says, as the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna with the tablets of the covenant law so that it might be preserved. The Israelites ate, ate manna 40 years until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna. Am I? Probably not. Manna. Manna. Uh, it's manna. Yes, sir. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. <laughs> Canaan. Canaan. There we go. <laughs> Um, you got it, bro. I did. I did want to talk about that. That thirty-five. We're talking about a legit forty years here. That stood out to me. I was talking to my mom about that. Was like how I read the Bible in the timeline as if I'm reading the Bible when a when a lot of these stories are in like like you see here like forty years like you know like we're talking about forty years. None of us have touched forty yet. I don't think. Joey might, <laughs> but close, but, close, close. See, like none of us have scratched 40 yet. Right. But we're reading this story in, you know, uh, a month's time. And I'm, and I'm thinking of it as if these events happen so fast, which is another big thing to keep in mind as well. And especially when we're looking at them kind of complain in this desert of sin, but this might've been over a course of who knows how long, but I know in 35, it says 40 years. So, that's a long time. Something to keep in mind there. I also heard um I heard that this journey that they were supposed to take, mm -hmm. they were only was supposed to last like maybe four months or four days or something, but since they were like complaining and like doing all the, you know human tendencies it like it took them 40 years so it didn't have to take them that 40 years but it was almost like that whole generation they got like that moses brought out like they had to break that generational curse of unfaithfulness and ungratefulness i don't know if alec or uh bren y'all have heard that concept mm. i'm with it though. yeah that's true that's true and 40 years is the year of testing if you see throughout the bible 40 years is the is the time of testing that God uses. So it's symbolic also. Mm, that's huge. I'm glad we didn't skip over that. All right, 17, and then I got to run and grab a charger really quick. All right, 17, water from the rock. Okay. So so they, quar they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you qu uh, quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why do you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and the lifestyle die of thirst? So here we go again. It just is, it's just the same cycle that we saw with uh, Pharaoh's cycle as far as the um, plague goes. Um, just on the opposite side of the spectrum here. Uh, six... I will stand there before you by the rock. Okay, so this is when he strikes the rock and the water came out for the people to drink. Um, he did this in sight of the elders of Israel and he called the place Mas um, Mas I don't want to say Massa, but it might be. I think so. Massa and Meribah. Because the Israelites crowed and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? So here's another sign the Lord gave them. Uh, Moses said, oh, this was really cool, too. This was the first time we get to see jo uh, Joshua, um, which Moses said to Joshua, Ch choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So they go to war against the Amalekites. Um, so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with a sword. And then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blow out the name of Am Amalek from under heaven. And then we got, he said, because his hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. I like that. 
I like that because doesn't it doesn't jo uh Josh Joshua take over not take over but doesn't he get put into leadership command once Moses dies? I like that. Yeah, he's made wrong. So he was a a real man of God like that. All right, one second. one second. I I gotta grab us a charger and then we'll knock eighteen out and see what we got. One second. Go for it, mate. Hey guys, do you guys want to hear some of my notes that I have on seventeen? I think there's some, um, yeah. some fruitful stuff here. Uh, so I think it's Look. cool that when Moses is holding up his rod, um, when he lets it down, they start to lose the fight, and um, Aaron and her actually like set up a rock and and hold his hands up for him. So to me, that showed fellow like the importance of fellowship. Uh, as we're like walking through, walking through our daily, our day to day, you know, that how how important fellowship is uh, when we're going through kind of like our day to day battles, and then at, and then this the sword is talked about in Ephesians as the word of God, right? So he uh his he defeated the Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So to me, that stuck out the importance of fellowship and the importance of um you know being being armed with the word of God. Right. So when we go through trials, making sure that we're leaning on our fellowship and that we're leaning on the word of God. Um, so those are just some symbolic things that kind of stick out to me. That you know, what I find interesting about that, um, Alec, is that God required them to do work. And as soon as the work was not being done and it's, it's kind of weird, like what what did God define as as being the important thing of holding the hands up what must it have been moses's ha uh, muscles holding the hands up or must he have just been trying to hold his hands up or or could it be anyone holding his hands up it's like how did they know what the rules were it's like a little bit strange um on top of that god has infinite power but he still required them to do work and whenever the work wasn't being done god wasn't helping them and so kind of that represents yeah god can give you anything but if you're not actually willing to put in any efforts, then why would he help you? I like it. I picked up late on the conversation, but what you were saying, I was loving. Um, yeah, but it's also kind of strange. It's also kind of strange, like they could kind of bend the rules a little bit and they could hold up Moses's arms, you know, as opposed to it just having to be Moses. It's strange how that, like, works in a kind of, uh, I don't know, for lack of a better word, like legal sense. It's almost sounds like a spiritual legal loophole in a way. <laughs> well, to me, that's why it just speaks so strongly to fellowship, right? That on our own, we begin yeah. to wither, right? Even if we're, you know, we're praying, we're reading our Bible. If we don't have fellowship, the fellowship is a big piece of that puzzle um, to keep us strong, to keep us hot, to keep us encouraged. Uh, without fellowship, we, we start to wither, you know? So I just thought that was super powerful. Yeah. And also the... I, I, I didn't, I didn't the know that. You skipped that, Alec. My bad. I skipped that. I didn't even... Pick, oh, no. That is huge. That's huge on fellowship. I like that one. I have to keep that one in the bag. I like that one. My bad. I cut you short, bro. No, that's good. That's it. Yeah.